Sometimes, despite your best efforts, your recovery gets derailed. Powerful life triggers, a lack of support, a wrong turn. Relapse happens, it's frustrating, but the important thing is to not wait another day to get back on track. Foundations Recovery Network is here to help with more than a dozen outpatient programs and six residential treatment centers to choose from. Our co-occurring treatment model gets to the root of your addiction, putting you back on the road to recovery. Call 877-714-1318 to reach our confidential helpline 24-7. We're waiting by the phone. That Sober Guy podcast contains adult content, merciless truth, and emotional nudity. Listener discretion is advised. Yo, what's up? Thank you for tuning in today. Thanks to humans for bringing us in and thanks to you for supporting the show. If you haven't checked out any of humans music, uh, as you might know, they do the intro and the closing for the show and, uh, man, just some great folks, good homies of the show and, uh, also have some phenomenal music. So be sure to check them out. It's great to bring you Sober Guy Radio from the East Bay Area up here in Northern California. The sun is shining today. It's a beautiful day. We're in a little town called Vacaville, which I think also means Cowtown if you go old school. So all my Vacavillians in my Cowtown homies, what's up to you? Much love. I want to thank everybody for supporting this recovery movement. It continues to grow. And if we all play our part and we we do our uh, our little piece of it, we can really come together collectively, not only to live better lives ourselves, but to impact our communities and impact the people around us uh, that may be searching for a better life themselves. So I'm just super honored to be a part of that. Uh, we're going to be down in San Diego, California, April 3rd through the 6th doing some podcasting at Hotel Del Coronado for the Innovations in Recovery Conference. Big thanks to Foundations Recovery Network for not only hosting the event as they put on some of the best events in the industry, but also inviting Sober Guy Radio down uh, to hang out, to learn some new things about the recovery industry, as well as do some podcasting and talk to some great people. So uh, once again, thanks to them. If you'd like to find more information about the event, you can go to foundationsevents.com slash innovations in recovery. Now, one of the tools that I like to use is transitions daily. And what it is, it's a daily AA email delivered right to my inbox. And it usually comes to my inbox about 8 p.m. Pacific time. What I like to do is let it sit in there till the following morning. So that way, every morning when I wake up, I grab a cup of coffee and I go to the daily AA email. And it's really a great way for me to start my day. It helps get my mind right, get focused for the day. And it really takes about five to 10 minutes to uh, to, to read. And there's some, some great things in there and I uh, really enjoy using it. And I know you would too if you tried it out. So if you'd like to do that, it's free, which is always a good thing. You go to dailyaaemails.com. And uh, you can find out more information there about it and how you can sign up to get the daily AA email delivered right to your inbox. So today's guest is Michael Grabart, and uh, he's got a great story to share. And he's also got a new book out called Sober Dad. And I'm really, really stoked to uh, get to talk to him today about this. I mean, because who doesn't want to be a better parent, right? Whether you're a dad or a mother, it doesn't really matter. Um, we all want to be better parents. At least I would hope so. I would like to think that I know, uh, in, in my driving force behind, um, you know, me wanting to get sober was of course I wanted to be a better parent. My daughter was only two at the time, uh, when, when I made that decision and I saw how I was living my life and I finally had the the realization that I didn't want her, um, to, to see that. And not only that, uh, many of us grew up in, in very alcoholic and dysfunctional families, um, you know, in, in my case, luckily there was a lot of love there, but there was also a lot of, a lot of dysfunction and a lot of, uh, a lot of immaturity and, um, miscommunication. I think that's a great way to describe it. Uh, so when I saw that, you know, I, I was kind of going down that same path. I said, man, I don't want a life like that. I don't want a life like that for my, for my daughter. 
And uh, now, you know, in, in time, I also have a son now too. And so thankfully, you know, up until today, neither one of them have, have seen me intoxicated or, uh, or, or acting, well, they probably see me act like a fool a couple of times. I can't, I don't think I can get out of that one, but, uh, that is, uh, that's, that's just being human, I think. And so I try to give, give myself a little bit of grace on that, but, um, sober dad is the book. And we're going to talk a bit more about that with Michael today. But first I want to tell you about a new treatment program, DXRX. DXRX provides access to alcohol treatment specialists to safe medication and ongoing monitoring for people who want to stop or reduce their drinking. And it's all done through a simple phone app. Now here's what will happen on your first appointment. Before you start the program, actually, you can go on the site and you can take a test and it'll assess your drinking. It'll give you an idea if you're drinking too much or if maybe you're not. Uh, Chances are, if you're questioning it, you might be and you might want to go check it out and take the test. Uh, Once you get to that point and you decide to go through with it, you'll meet with a physician who is a specialist in addiction. You'll discuss your goals for drinking, your health history, uh, and any concerns you might have. And then the physician will create a personalized care plan just for you. You can then monitor your progress with the breathalyzer and the DXRX mobile app. The physician will also recommend safe, effective, non-habit forming medicine that will help you ease the alcohol cravings while you're going through the process. Now, the DXRX team is a great group of doctors and professionals from right here in in, uh, Northern California Bay Area. And I've said it before, Jess and I met with them personally. We went and had some dinner with them. They showed us the lab where they were doing all the tests and uh, and and running the um, the research that's being done on, on everything behind the DXRX program. And uh, they're really out to take substance abuse treatment to the next level and offer a new and innovative alternative option to treatment. Uh, so if you'd like to get more information about that, go to that sober and you'll see the DXRX logo stronger than alcohol. Click on the logo and get started today. All right. So we're going to get to the guest today. Super stoked to have him. Uh, do I say super stoked a lot? I think I do, but I am. I'm super stoked. I'm super excited. I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Uh, we got some great info. It's just very exciting thing to see what God has in store for us each and every day. And uh, man, I hope you feel the same way. Now, today's guest is Michael Grabart. And Michael's got a great story to share. I mentioned that he's got a new book out called Sober Dad, The Manual for Perfect Imperfect Parenting. Michael's a longtime sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He's been a a member of Al-Anon for decades, and he also attends Overeaters Anonymous meetings as well. As he says, if it moves, I'm obsessed with it. And if it stands still, I'm addicted to it. He's a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, Michael's married and the father of four children. He writes under a pseudonym to maintain his anonymity and speak frankly about his experiences in 12-step recovery. Michael, it's great to have you on Sober Guy Radio today, my friend. How are you? I'm great, Shane. Thanks for having me on. It's a privilege. Yeah, it's awesome, man. It's awesome. I'm, I'm really stoked to talk about the new book here, a little bit about your story. Um, I understand the, the book just launched in the last couple of days and it's already uh, up at number one, man. So that's great news. Yeah, I'm incredibly grateful. The book is number one on uh, Amazon's new books in the alcoholism uh, recovery field. And then it was also, it also reached number two the, the very first day on the parenting sub list for new releases as well. So um, you know, we're, we're all excited about the, the start of it and it just, it just sort of bodes well. I think it's a very important message and, you know, guys want to know how to be good dads. So yeah. <laughs> that, you know, that's what it's about. Well, that that's for sure. And I know, um, one of the driving factors behind it for me was to be a better father. My daughter was two at the time, uh, when, when I, when I made the decision to uh, clean my life up and, and, and quit drinking and get my, my, my shit together really. And, uh, I would love to jump in and hear a little bit about the book, uh, and then maybe we'll, uh, we'll we'll jump back and hear a little bit about your story as well. Oh, sure. I mean, the, the basic idea behind the book, uh, I was sitting in a, uh, in a Back to Basics AA meeting about a year and a half ago, and we're going over the simple rules in the doctor's opinion, trust God, clean house, help others. And I write books for a living, and all of a sudden, I mean, I've heard it a thousand times, and I love it. I've been sober for 25 years, and day at a time, thank you, God. And all of a sudden, the book writing sort of bell went off in my head and said, that's a book. Yeah. You could do a book about that. 
So I went and wrote it just for the heck of it. And it's an essay about each of those three simple rules. And the book is called Three Simple Rules. Mm -hmm. I sent it to my literary agent. She sent it to Hazelden. It just so happened that there was an editor at Hazelden who, her name is Vanessa, and she's just started working there that week. And she was looking for a guy who could write about sobriety as opposed to a professional or there are plenty of women who could. But you know, she was looking for a guy. Yeah. And, and this comes across her desk and she just fell in love. It's a total god shot. So then she reaches out and she says, I also want you to do a book about sober fatherhood. So, and it's going to be called Sober Dad. And, and they said, you know, do you, and I've got four kids, as you mentioned, they're nine to 16. I'm all about my kids. I, you know, I grew up in a very alcoholic, insane home. And I knew what I didn't want to do as a father, but I had no idea of how to do it the right way. So this book is basically what I learned and how it screwed up and, you know, made amends along the way. But it's basically lessons learned about how to be a sober father, if especially if you come from the insanity that so many of us do, uh, an alcoholic, highly dysfunctional home. So that's really what the book is all about. Many of us who struggle with addiction, with alcoholism, grew up in that type of environment. Uh, tell us a little bit about what life was like for you as a kid growing up. <laughs> well, I like to say I overcame every advantage on the way to the bottom because... <laughs> You know, on the one hand, it was kind of a white picket fence experience. It was a really nice, it's a beautiful house, in a nice neighborhood. Uh, my aunt was a designer, and she actually got our house into Brides Magazine when I was about 15, which is about the same time that the wheels came off in my parents' marriage, in my father's drinking, and actually in my drinking as well. And so, you know, my folks were fighting constantly, and... My sisters and I were clueless, and we were all turning to, in my case, alcohol, and, you know, uh, I, I, they can speak for themselves, but we all ended up in a lot of trouble, and, you know, we're trying to maintain this image. We don't even realize that we're trying to do it, to maintain an image yeah. of this, you know, all-American family, but on the inside, it's, uh, it's, 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 just, it's just insanity, and, you know, I came out of there, the expression that people use today is failure to launch, and... You know, I went to college, I got a law degree, I published novels, but at the same time, um, I couldn't hold a relationship together for more than an hour, I couldn't keep a dollar in my pocket, I was totally unemployable. So it's sort of like all the scars of a childhood that looked fine on the outside, you know, we're, 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 we're starting to, you know, show, you know, burst forth, but I had no idea, I was clueless. So, you know, yeah. until I got into al then I got sober, so. Um, do you think that that your past in in what you've had to overcome and been through from your family life and then as well personally has that really helped you find your passion in uh, in writing? Yeah, that's a great question, and absolutely. The, the the short answer is yes. I was I don't know if I was born with the ability to write well, but I had it from from an early age, and that's just a gift from God. Yeah. But the thing is that you know, ultimately, whatever you're writing about, your subject really is real life, people, emotions, how they interact, how people get along, how they don't get along. And if you're clueless about yourself, and you're clueless about life, and you're clueless about people, it doesn't matter how good you are in terms of your skills, your writing's going to be useless. Yeah. So, you know, so the good news is that I, you know, by getting into recovery, uh, by getting into therapy, and just countless seminars and books, and I was just so you know, curious about, okay, I can't, I can't live like this anymore. I was 33. I can't be a failure anymore. How do I straighten myself out? So I, I was able to learn so much and basically finally marry some real life understanding of how human beings function and how I function and yeah. how the world works with the ability to write. So that's sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, Joe and Charlie say we live two lives. We live the crazy alcoholic life and then we get to live the sober life. And you know, as a writer, I'm fortunate in, in a way, I'm fortunate to have been through both because I just have more empathy and understanding than I ever would have. And, you know, and that's that's kind of why I wrote Sober Dad. I, it, you know, I mean, I, I wrote it because they asked me to, but yeah. <laughs> the, the, you know, the usefulness and they paid me to. But the usefulness of the book is that um, people, uh, most books for parents are written by sane therapists and professionals writing for basically sane parents who just want a few tweaks or tips and tricks. Yeah, yeah that's a good point. And, you know, but what if, what, if, what if that's not you? What if you have no idea? What if all you know is what you don't want to do as a father? I don't want to repeat the steps that happened in my home. Well, how do you take different, a different path? And that's what I try to do in Sober Dad. 
Well, you had mentioned too that you you didn't really start to to have this um, this enlightening or this experience on wanting to change your life um, at until thirty three, and I know um, at that point, especially with kids and stuff, you know, a lot of a lot of guys, a lot of people, probably in general. Um, to no fault of their own. So I'm not doubting this at all, but they just kind of settle and they just continue to roll, roll with the punches and just kind of just go. Um, when you stop and you kind of have that experience, there's a lot of vulnerability involved in having to change and having to learn even at 33. Um, even though, you know, that's, that's, um, that's still quite, quite young, I would like to think. And, uh, how do you, how do you get through that and being vulnerable and then talk about the power of vulnerability, like as you start to move forward and start to learn and, and better yourself really in, and not only just in a, a 12 step pro- program, uh, excuse me, and getting sober, but also in your professional life too. Cause you have a, a, a quite the, the good story of entrepreneurship as well. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I, I mean, you know, vulnerable comes from the Latin word vulnus, which means wound. So if you're going to be vulnerable, it means that you can be wounded. And by the time I was 33, you know, I couldn't have been wounded anymore. It's like you can't, you know, my my expression was you can't kill a dead man. And I mean, you know, I mean, I was all, I'd already failed at everything. You know, I'd I'd, I'd worked for law firms for, you know, five months, six months, fired, unable to get another job. Uh, I started a business, not the current business, but a different one. I started on credit cards because I heard the director, Robert Townsend, say he financed a movie on credit cards. I'm like, that's brilliant. That's great financing. (laughs) So I got like 17 credit cards. I maxed them all out. The business failed. And, you know, and there I am with $33,000 worth of credit card debt and no income. So it's sort of like you can't shoot a dead man. I mean, you can shoot it, but it's, you know, you're not going to make it any worse. So, you know, I mean, life life made me vulnerable. And uh, fortunately, I was able to, I guess, yeah, it's true. A lot of guys really have to, like screw up a couple of marriages and a couple of sets of kids and 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 their whole career before they're really willing to get that they need sobriety. You know, yeah. if, if if people are lucky enough to do this in their teens or their twenties, you know, that's fantastic. You know, thirty three, great. But you know, I, I mean, it, it's just it was just really, I, I didn't I didn't have an actual gun in my mouth. Sometimes you hear people talk about yeah. the gun in the mouth moment in their yeah. stories. But for me, it felt that way. It felt like, why don't I just blow my own head off? Because I've totally effed up life. And what's the point? Yeah. So, you know, it was either it was either kill myself or get clean. And uh, and I got clean. And, you know, that's uh, that started everything. That started everything in the right yeah. direction, finally. So you're you're a very active uh, member in Alcoholics Anonymous 12 step program um and congrats on 25 years by the way that's uh that's just Thank you. phenomenal and um it's really inspiring for a guy like me and hopefully others out there listening you know I have three and a half years I'm sure people out there listening have you know a few months a few years maybe they have 10 plus uh in any case 25 of them that's that's huge um I think there's so many different outlets today with technology evolving and Lots of new programs and new things out there. Um, AA has really been a big part of my recovery and treatment in in uh, in in working the steps. And although it's not, I, I don't want to say it's the end all be all. Maybe it's not for everybody, right? Everyone's kind of different. But what would you say to someone out there who wants to get help? Uh, but they're scared to try AA. I mean, I hear this a lot. M- maybe they don't want to go out in their communities. They don't want to show face. They, they've they had a bad experience. They heard about a bad experience. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, Michael? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, the reason I'm fortunate enough to be sober this long is because I never quit on myself. And I always let God just, you know, run the show as best mm-hmm. I could. I'll take my will back. But every day I hit, I hit my knees, keep me from the first drink, direct my thoughts on my actions, and, you know, the third step. Yeah. And, that's, uh, you know, people who don't go to meetings don't find out what happens to people who don't go to meetings. And I've consistently <laughs> gone to meetings and I've consistently sponsored people. I've consistently been sponsored. Um, you know, could you hide a hundred dollar bill in my big book and I won't find it for a year or two? Yes. But, you know, <laughs> despite that, you know, that's an old age. But, but yeah. you know, I've, I've all, I, I, look, I'm so grateful for this, for the life that it's given me. But I, I mean, look, I completely get it because I had eight first days in Alcoholics Anonymous uh, there were a lot of reasons why I didn't want to go to AA. I didn't want to be like my father or anybody else in my family who was alcohol. I wanted to be the good one, yeah. you know, the, the good one, because to me it was a moral issue. 
I, I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to give up my best friend. You know, I trusted alcohol. For me, the mental obsession part of the threefold disease, physical, mental, spiritual, the mental part was that I trusted alcohol more than I trusted people. You know, uh, a girl might say, no, I'm not going to sleep with you. A boss might say, you're fired. But alcohol never said no. The bank might say you're out of money, but alcohol never said no. So, you know, I mean, I get the fact that um, as somebody who's thinking about AA or thinking about needing recovery is saying, wait a minute, if I give up my best friend, if I give up the only thing that works for me, what's left? Yeah, and, there, yeah. you know, there comes a point where you have that moment of clarity, you have your own gun in the mouth moment, and you say, hey, you know something? The alcohol isn't working anymore. The, the 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 pills or the drugs or the substitutes or you know whatever it is, it's not getting it done for me. And my solution is worse than my problems. Yeah. So, you know when when, when you when you can when you can acknowledge that and nobody alcoholics don't like to be told what to do. They think they're going to go to an AA meeting. Everybody's going to stick a finger in their face and tell them this is what you have to do. And for the most part, today unfortunately, newcomers are all but ignored in meetings. No one's going to say boo to you. Sit in the, you know. <laughs> so it's funny. not like. I mean, yeah. it's unfortunate, but, you know, go yeah. sit in the back, get there, you know, get there two minutes late and leave two minutes early so you don't have to talk to anybody, but just keep trying it. And eventually you're going to hear somebody who's telling your story. And they say, they used to say, I don't know if that, I haven't heard in a long time, compare, don't, you know, I mean, don't identify, don't compare. In other words, you know, one guy's going to say, well, I was married four times. She said, well, I wasn't married four times. I'm not an alcoholic. You know, I didn't, you know, I went to jail <laughs> yeah. 12 times. Well, I didn't go to jail. You know, listen for the feelings. If you can identify with the feelings of the people who are speaking, then maybe you belong. And if you're wondering if you're an alcoholic, put it this way. Uh, people who are not alcoholics don't wonder if they are. Mm -hmm. So the mere fact that you're wondering if you are is a pretty good indication that you are. Non-alcoholics don't go to Alcoholics Anonymous to figure out if they're alcoholic. They don't do that. They know they're not. It doesn't cross their mind. You know, am I a Martian? No. I don't need to go to Martians Anonymous to, you know, and sit there and like, am I, am I green? You know, do I have one eye in my forehead? You know, do I miss the red planet? No, I'm not a Martian. So, yeah. you know, but, but believe me, if, 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 if you're going to AA meetings or you're thinking about it, you're a Martian. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. A Martians Anonymous. I'll have to check that one out. See oh yeah. It's, uh, see if it's around in my community. Oh, it's um, great. Hey Michael, so uh, what, this is I've been waiting to ask you this. I think this is such a such an important question uh, for those out there, uh, for myself to hear as well as everybody out there listening. Um, what has sobriety and what has a twelve step program given you, man? Wow, it's a great question. Well, it's given me the real me. You know, if if you scrape off the over reliance on the character defects or what my sponsor calls bad habits that we come in with anger manipulation fear uh justification self-pity uh, desire for revenge uh, envy pride if you take all, sloth if you take all of that stuff and remove it then you get to find out who you really are and what i got to find out in aa was that was something i really never knew which is that I'm a beautiful child of God. God has my picture on his refrigerator. <laughs> now, great. that may sound like, you know, obvious and trite, but the reality is that I had, you know, I didn't have a relationship with a higher power. And coming from an alcoholic home, I didn't know if I was lovable. I didn't know if I was deserving of love. And today I know that I am deserving of my love, of my own love for myself, of God's love, my wife's love, my kids' love. Uh, I, I have a business and... Um, I'm, I, I, I'm worthy of the love and respect that I receive from my clients and my team. You know, so, so it's, it's the sense of I can stand up straight and I'm proud to be me. And I like being me. I'm relatively comfortable. They said this when I came in. They said, you're not going to be happy all the time, but you're going to be relatively comfortable in your own skin most of the time. Yeah. I'm like, that's a hell of a deal. It so, is. you know, I mean, so I'm talking about the inside stuff. On the outside stuff, you know, I mean, I have a successful business that I learned how to start when a member of Debtors Anonymous sat me down at a Dunkin' Donuts <laughs> and showed me how to start a business on a single sheet of paper. And he's still in my life. He's been my sponsor uh, or one of my best friends now for 23 years. I just saw him a couple of weeks ago uh, down in wow. Florida. And, you know, I mean, uh, so I, ha you know, so I, I, I can make a living today. I'm no longer broke 
I'm no longer upside down, which I was for so, you know, when I had that $33,000 worth of debt on my credit cards, mm -hmm. uh, I actually, when I got sober, I took out savings bank life insurance for $35,000. So that way, if I died, the credit card companies would get paid off. Oh, you know, wow. I, I, you know, to, today I don't have to think in those terms and I'm a responsible, you know, I mean, I'm a responsible, it's so funny. I, I never lose sight of the fact that people have no idea what a beast I was or what a wild man or what an insane person I was mm. chasing women and throwing money away and being stupid. Today, you know, people just look at me. It's like, oh, okay. You know, when you have kids, they're your ambassadors. Yeah. And so my, you know, <laughs> my kids are like, you know, people see my kids. They, oh, uh, uh, that's so-and-so's dad. And, uh, and, and, you know, I'm just the dad. I'm just another dad. I'm just another guy. And, um, you know, and, and, I'm laughing. I'm like, you have no idea who I really am. <laughs> <laughs> if you only knew, if we could if only, only go knew. back in time. <laughs> Yeah. That's funny, man. Well, I think that's a good point too. So speaking of your kids, um, you know, what, what has living, living a sober lifestyle. And I want people to understand too, when, when we talk about being sober, it's not just taking alcohol out of the equation. That's the face oh. of it. There's so much more to it. It's unpeeling layers upon layers of things that have gone on in our lives, in our in our childhoods, in our teen years, in into our adult years, who kind of shaped who the who the people we are up until today. Um, what what has that been like for for your family, and what have you been able to give back to your kids uh, living living a life in recovery? Yeah, it's a great question. That's what the book Sober Dad is all about. Um, they get a father who is not just physically sober, but emotionally sober most of the time, not all the times. I'm still a knucklehead. Yeah. I'm still, very, I mean, I'm, I'm an emotional person, just who I am. Me too. That's just, <laughs> just wired that way. And, yeah. and so be it. I'm not going to, you know, I really, I, I thought I would outlive my emotions because my father never showed me emotions. So I figured, well, at some point I won't have any more feelings and then I'll be happy. <laughs> so, you know, it's pretty stupid. Yeah, that makes sense. But, but yeah, hey, yeah, Why exactly. Not? <laughs> but yeah, you know, when it comes to when it comes to my kids, it means that from the time they were little, if I made a mistake, I got down on my knees and looked them in the eye uh, when they were that small and apologized because it says made amends. It doesn't say made amends and there's an asterisk only to people over eighteen or not to your kids. So there's some humility in that. Um, I've I've uh, I, I know the difference between an alcoholic dysfunctional home and the quiet kind of home that we're trying to my wife and I are trying to provide here. And every minute, I mean, like you know, just. Just coming home and hanging out with my kids. Or last night, uh, you know, a couple of them have it's winter. You know, they've got colds or whatever. So I was just lying down on the big bed with two of them. One, you know, I had my arm around, uh, you know, under the, uh, you know, around the shoulders of, uh, of, 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 you know, one on each side, and we're just hanging out, and it's just peaceful. It's beautiful, you know. It's like how do you not inflict perfectionism on a kid? Yeah. Well, you know, just let them be, and then just. You know, my favorite word is namaste. You hear it at the end of a yoga class, which is, yeah. the you know, the divinity in me sees and salutes the divinity in you. That's the approach that I have to parenting. It's namaste. It's that there's there's a spark of God in my kids. And I see it and I salute it. And I and and, and my job, I mean, I joke and I say my, my role as a parent is like a flight attendant. I'm primarily here for your safety and occasionally I'll toss you a snack, you know. So, <laughs> I love it. you know. But, you know, I'm not trying to shape them into whatever. Uh, one of the things I write about in Sober Dad is uh, a quote from one of the people who mentored me in parenting, which is that we are not raising moral children. We are raising children to be moral adults. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, of, of course they're going to lie. Kids lie because they haven't learned that they're not supposed to. Well, I stopped lying in my mid-30s. So why am I expecting them to stop lying at seven? You know? <laughs> yeah, so it's point. like. So it's you know it really comes down to can I cut them a break can I can I can I can I allow them the dignity of their own humanity uh, or do I have to be an a hole because I don't yeah. I don't know if there's a middle ground you know yeah yeah man that's you got me on that one I, I my my kids are my kids are two and six and so just just hearing you describe that um, you know I'm kind of relating to it in in my own experience and it's it's tough sometimes you know and definitely um, trying to balance. And I don't, I don't know that, um, a lot of us in recovery are great at balancing things. I know for me, it's usually uh pedal to the metal. And, uh, thankfully that tends to go into a positive aspect today instead of, mo you know, negative ones like in the past. All right. I have a question for you here, um, uh, with regards to the book too, you, you, you've had, and, uh, moving forward, our, our, our 
going to continue to have a very successful career. How many, how many books, um, have you, have you actually written or published? Like, just give me a rough <laughs> estimate. I have, I have a question to follow up with this. A lot, a lot, I, you know, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'm walking a fine line because, um, you know, for the sake of anonymity, I'm not using my real name sure. and I'm not talking about, you know, um, the business, and, my, the business yeah. or, or, or stuff that would identify me in that way, because I, I'm trying to be respectful of the, uh, of the, of the traditions while at the same time, you know, uh, taking the opportunity to talk about the book. So let me just say a lot. You said sober dad is, is one of your favorites, if not your favorites to date. So why, why is that out of all of the content and and wonderful work that you've written? Um, what is sober? What is so important about sober dad? Well, for me, there's no filter in that book. It's just raw how I feel about myself, how I feel about parenting, how I feel about my kids, how I feel about my dad, how I feel about everything that needs to be said. So it's not, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to, you know, put lipstick on a pig. I'm not trying to make things prettier than they are. Um, it's, it's, it's just me unplugged. Do you feel like you you could kind of take the gloves off at this point when you wrote this in a sense and just get after it? Yeah. I mean, I have nothing to lose. You know, uh, some, uh, somebody I work with said, said something really nice to me. He said, you have nothing, you have nothing to hide, nothing to lose. And it, it comes back to what I said earlier. You can't kill a dead man. I mean, I died of alcoholism and I'm not, you know, without getting preachy, uh, I don't know if I was reborn, but it's sort of like, I, I finally had a life to have. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, so it's like, what can, what can you do to me that I didn't do to myself with alcohol and stupidity. So what do I care? You know what? Read the book. You don't like the book. You don't like me. My life will go on. But is there enough in that book in Sober Dad to help a person radically see a better way to view his own life, his marriage, and uh, the role of, of, of being a father and being a man in society? Hell yes. Yeah. So, you know, awesome. I mean, I, look, I love my kids. I love writing and I love sobriety. And in Sober Dad, I got to, you know, work on all three at the same time. What more could I ask for? Yeah. So one last question for you, Michael, uh, how can someone, uh, or let's say there's a, there, let's say there's a parent out there. They want to be a better parent to their kids. They want to be a better person. Um, what advice can you give them to get started on, on a, on a road to recovery? You know, ask for help, pray for help, but don't do it alone. Tiger Woods has a swing coach just to help him swing a golf club. You know, P- NBA players have, uh, have uh, coaches to help them uh, shoot free throws. Think about Shaq, all the people he went through, and back in the day. If if it's okay for athletes to have coaches, why do we think trying to do something a million times harder and more meaningful, which is, and I love sports, but which is to be a parent, why do, why do we think that we have all the answers in our heads? You know, find people who know things, get a deep bench in AA, guys who have parents and have been where you want to be, and, and uh, there's nothing wrong with going into therapy, getting outside help. If you can find somebody great, which I did. And, you know, and, uh, you know, if people want to get in touch, I have a website. It's Michael Graubart, G-R-A-U-B-A-R-T.com, or they can just Google the book Sober Dad. I have an email address, asksoberdad at gmail.com. If they've got a question for me, I've got a blog that goes out through Hazelden's website. Hazelden is the one that published the book. So, you know, the main thing is don't go it alone. You know, alcohol, AA is a we program. And, uh, uh, you know, they say it takes a village. In my case, it takes a village idiot to be a parent. But, you know, <laughs> at least but you're the thing honest, is, right? <laughs> let's tell the truth. I mean, you know, yeah. I want my wife, I want my wife to hear this and go, yep, that's him. <laughs> that's him. So we know that's, that's him. Knucklehead. Oh, good stuff, man. Good stuff. Well, I'll, uh, all of those links will be in the show notes, folks, out there listening. So you'll be able to, uh, to click on any of those in the show notes page. Uh, Michael, it's been an honor, man. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing a little bit about your story and for sharing the new book that's out, Sober Dad. Uh, be sure to pick it up, folks. Michael, thanks again, man. Man, you're a great guy. You're a great guy. Thanks for having me on the show. It was really a privilege. Thank you so much.